بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد Can we have a second now salawat for the love of Fatima to Zahra عليه السلام اللهم صل Can we have the third law salawat for the Imam of our time, Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. The issue of hijab has preoccupied the discussions of generations before us and continues to do so, creating much criticism. What many people fail to understand is that the hijab is not only the social, it's the physical as well. You can't have the social hijab if you don't have the physical. And you can't have the physical hijab if you don't have the social. Islam emphasizes on maintaining one's decency and, mod mod and modesty when interacting with the opposite gender. And the dress code is an overall of this. We as Muslims get bombarded by both the philosophical and the social questions regarding hijab. There are so many views and opinions present about hijab that the whole issue and the true meaning of hijab has become blurred. In today's talk, I want to avoid the cliché talk on hijab and rather focus on the logics behind wearing the hijab. What is the benefits of wearing hijab? Why should we maintain wearing the hijab? What is the need of maintaining and preserving hijab? 
Now, in today's talk, inshallah, I will be focusing on a number of aspects. Number one, about lowering the gaze. What, what is the philosophy behind lowering the gaze? Why should we lower the gaze as the, as the Quran commands us to do so? Number two, I want to focus on the, on the male aspect of hijab. What is the social aspect of hijab for men? What is the physical aspect of hijab for men? And third of all, I want to focus on a woman's hijab. What is the physical aspect or the commandments of hijab for a woman? And what is the social commandments of hijab for a woman? And number four, I want to speak about how we can address the issue of hijab to the general public. How can we speak about hijab in the, gen in, in the public or in today's generation? Now, when it comes to lowering the gaze, as we know in the Quran, in, in Surah An-Nur, Surah 24, verse number 30 and 31, the Quran commands both men and women to lower their gaze. Now, many people say that in this generation, it's unavoidable. You know, we have to look at the opposite gender. We have to interact in the opposite gen um, to the opposite gender. So many people say, you know, how can we lower our gaze in such a society? But the real question is, what is the need of lowering the gaze? Why should we lower the gaze? Now, when it comes to, to, to analyzing why an individual needs to lower their gaze, we must focus on the, um, on the psychological impact of the eyes. You see, the eyes is a very powerful tool. The eyes is the window to the soul and to the heart. Now, when, for example, those who have studied public speaking, those who are public speakers, the, one of the main points in making a very strong public speech or a public lecture is, they say, is maintaining eye contact with the audience. They say that when an individual maintains eye contact with their audience, that physical barrier between them and the audience is broken, and that physical distance is narrowed. And they say that they engage the audience on the personal level. Now, despite, pers despite public speakers or students or work employees who have to interact with the opposite gender, um, we must take this on a personal level. Now, people interacting, and even if it's unavoidable and you have to interact with the opposite gender or establish eye contact with the opposite gender, then the complete hijab must be maintained. But when you take the same concept and you apply it on a personal level, when a man and a woman engage and um, establish eye contact and do not lower their gaze on a personal level, then that physical barrier between a man and a woman is broken and it's narrowed, and they begin to interact with one another on a personal level. And this is exactly what the Quran speaks about. The Quran speaks about physical par barriers as hijab. So when an individual interacts with someone from the opposite gender on a personal level and establishes eye contact with them, then, they get, then the physical barrier is broken. And in the hadith tell us that shaitan's arrow, arrow is shot, which leads to deviation. Um, Prophet Isa alayhi salam has said that when a man looks at a woman or when a woman looks at a man and, it, and interacts with her, then a seed of desire is planted in the heart of the individual, which leads to their deviation. You see, the eyes is a very powerful tool that when an individual witnesses a crime or witnesses a, an act of immorality, that has a detrimental effect, uh, impact on the soul of the individual. And that individual loses a sense of innocence. Now, when you come, um, there are many books distributed in the West and many articles and many texts um, written in the West about the art of seduction. It talks about how to seduce a person from the opposite gender. Now, when you read about this, you see that it says the number one aspect when it says that how you seduce an individual from the opposite gender is to establish eye contact with them. And not only that, it says establish eye contact with them, look away and look back at them, and you've already sent the message across that you're interested. And this is dis distributed within the West. This is exactly what Islam talks about when it talks about lowering the gaze. It's because when an individual looks at someone from the opposite gender and looks away and looks back, th back at them, they've sent the message across that I'm interested. In Islam, the first look is for you. The second look is against you. You can look at someone from the opposite gender who you may find attractive once, accidentally. But the next time you look at them, that is forbidden and not allowed. You see, this is what the Quran talks about. Um, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir has said that when the eyes of the individual looks at someone from the opposite gender in a lustful way, that is the fornication of the eyes. A kiss is a fornication of the lips and the touch of a non-mahram woman or a non-mahram man is a fornication of the hands. You see, that's how powerful the eyes is. If you read the Treaties of Rights by Imam Zain al-Abidin you see that it's a beautiful text. Um, it talks about the rights that individuals have over other individuals. It talks about the rights of your body parts, which ha 
the rights that your body parts have over you. And in the treaties of rights, it says that every body part within you has a right over you. Now your eyes on the day of judgment will speak against you and speak about everything which you have looked at. And you see, when it comes to the eyes, when it comes to the eyes, that's in the treaties of rights, it says, it is the right of your eyes that you should cast it down from things which are forbidden from you and from individuals which are forbidden from you. You should not use your eyes only in the place where you increase your insight and you increase your knowledge. And because the eyes is the door to contemplation. That's the words of Imam Zain al-Abideen, beautiful words. And when you look at Surah number 24, verse number 30 and 31, about lowering the gaze, when Allah commands men and women to lower their gaze, you see that when this ayah was revealed, it wasn't only revealed in terms of not looking at the opposite gender or not looking at something forbidden from you. These, this ayah was revealed in terms of lowering your gaze from everything which is forbidden from you. And that includes those websites, those magazines, those pictures and those videos. And I really don't need to go into specific of what I'm talking about. You see, when an individual looks at a woman wearing revealing clothing or a man wearing the revealing clothing, that seed of desire is planted in the heart of that individual. That unwanted desire is planted in that individual's heart. And the heart begins to rot. You see that through a psychological point of view, that everything you see during the day is stored within your brain. And those images and those things that you witness during the day accu accumulates and, and gathers up. And the only way to relieve yourself from what you have seen is to, through manifesting those same desires into action. You see, that's why the Quran commands both men and women as a part of hijab, as a commandment of hijab to lower their gaze. Because, that, because when you go to the rates of the individuals that turn to the haram acts or turn to the haram roots through satisfying their desires, you'll see that then you'll see the power of lowering your gaze. Because you wouldn't get to that stage where you need to reveal yourself from these unwanted desires if you didn't look at it in the first place. If you prevent it from the beginning, then you would see that you wouldn't get to that stage where you would need to relieve yourselves from these desires. That's why lowering your gaze is a fundamental part of hijab. And that's why the Quran, when it first addressed hijab for both men and women, it first told men and women to lower your gaze because that's the beginning of hijab. Now, when you go to the hijab of men, now it's quite interesting because both Muslims and non-Muslims, when you talk about hijab, they associate hijab with women. They always say, you know, hijab is for women, it's not for men. When the Quran, when it sent down the commandments, when Allah sent down the commandments to, of hijab, it sent them down to men before it sent them down to women. It ordained men to wear hijab and um, perceive the hijab before it told women to uh, maintain their own hijab. Now you see in Surah An-Nur, Surah number 30, it says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظَ فُرُوجُهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ It says, oh, to the believing men, tell the believing men to lower their gaze, to guide their pri private parts, and to, um, sure, that is surely that it is pure for them, because Allah surely knows what that individual gets up to. The Quran tells men in, in terms of hijab to lower their gaze, which we already spoke about, that's the social. And then it tells men to guide their private parts, that's the physical. And then it says surely that is pure for them, because Allah surely knows what they get up to. You see that first it talks about lowering the gaze, we've already spoken about the benefits of lowering the gaze. And then it talks about guiding their private parts. So the first physical requirements of hijab for men is to guide their private parts, to, to cover their private parts. And then this goes further. When you read the Islamic texts and narrations, it says that part of the physical hijab of men is not only to guide their private parts. It's about not really revealing your chest. Some narrations in Islamic chest say those men that walk around topless or walk around showing their biceps, that's not part of hijab. It says that a man should walk on this earth with a sense of modesty and humility, that a man must have that sense of respect that he doesn't reveal himself, he doesn't show too much. Some marajah say that a man cannot wear shorts too high up where he shows his thighs or above the knees. And, and there's different opinions regarding what marajah consider as hijab. Some further on go, on go on to say that a man's beard is a sense of hijab, even if it's a very thin beard. Because they say that a man's beard, when a man maintains their beard, it's a sense of humility. It gives them a sense of hum humility and modesty. So that's what the requirements of the physical hijab for men. Now obviously there's different opinions regarding that. 
Now, when it comes to men, they say, you know, we live in a society where there's, there's women around us who, who are basically wearing nothing. It's really hard for us to maintain our hijab in both the social and the physical sense. They say that we live in a society, an imperfect society, where the majority of women are wearing revealing clothing. Now, when you look at Islam and you look at the historical stories, you see that there's so many historical stories that the prophets and the imams were in this exact same situation and they came out successful. Now, when you see Imam al-Kadhim, Imam al-Kadhim, when he was in prison, now the oppressive ruler Harun al-Rashid, when Imam al-Kadhim was in prison, Harun al-Rashid said he, he took this beautiful maid. She was absolutely stunning. She was beautiful. And he told this maid, your job is to go inside the prison cell of Imam al-Kadhim and to seduce him. That's your job. You serve him and you seduce him. Now, Imam, Imam al-Kadhim was in prison. This beautiful maid came in. She tried to seduce him, tried to do ev everything that the uh, um, ruler Harun Rashid told her to do. And, at, and, she, and it, would, it didn't take long where she threw to the ground in prostration to Allah. And she said, Subhanaka, Quddusun. She said, Quddusun, Subhanaka, Subhanak. That's made, she changed, completely changed her way. And people told her, when people saw that radical change in her, they said, what made that radical change within you? She said, when I saw Imam al kadhim he was such a pure servant of Allah. Now, despite and in contrary to Harun Rashid's intentions of bringing this beautiful woman in the prison cell of Imam al kadhim to seduce him, despite Harun Rashid's intentions, um, Imam al kadhim had complete and utter control upon his gaze. He was so devoted to Allah. He was in service of Allah. He was constantly in the worship of Allah that that created the change within that woman. Yes, as men, you may be surrounded by women wearing revealing clothing every single day. You may see a woman in front of you wearing revealing clothing, but you can control yourself just as the imams control themselves. You have controls over your actions. You can't blame your actions on another individual. And through the stories of the imam, it shows this. You see that the imam influenced her rather than her influencing him. Now, another story, as you all know, the famous story of Zuleikha and Yosef, the attempted seduction of Zuleikha. Now, Zuleikha, as it says in Surah Yosef, um, verse number 23, that Zuleikha, when she saw her husband wasn't around, she was a married woman, but she still had that desire or um, had that desire towards Yosef. The Surah, the surah says that when Yosef wasn't around, she closed all the doors and she told Yosef, come forward. So she tried to seduce him. So... But Yusuf, he said that I seek refuge from Allah. Yusuf had that acknowledgement that Allah is watching. Therefore, he had complete and utter control over his gaze. He had um, complete and utter control over his social hijab and his physical hijab. Despite Zuleikha, as narrations tell us, that she was such a beautiful woman and she was such a powerful woman as well. A man can easily fall into desire or to compromise his social and physical hijab for her. But Yusuf acknowledged he had that taqwa. He acknowledged that Allah is watching. And that's the sort of hijab that men should have, that humility, that modesty, that despite all the women around them, they still are able to maintain themselves. And um, when you come to the hijab of men, now many people, this is a common question, many people say that, so, okay, the social hijab is the same for men and women. And they say the, but when it comes to the physical hijab, why is there a greater need for a physical hijab on women than it is for men? If you know, if men and women both get tempted and they both get tempted into desire, why is there a need for both? You see, this answer is very clear. The reason why there's a greater emphasis on the hijab of women to men is because we have biological differences. If our bodies were the same, then the hijab for a man and woman should be the same as well. But there is biological distinctions between a man's body and a woman's body, which is why there's a greater need for a woman to cover up than a man. You just look at the alarming rates of uh, men who turn to pornography. The reason why they turn to look at such websites is because a woman's body is created to attract. Therefore, there's a greater need for women to cover up their bodies because the body is there to attract. So you see that a man's social hijab is the same because men and women both get tempted, which is why the social hijab is the same. But the physical hijab is different because there is a clear physical um, difference between a man's body and a woman's body. Now, when you look at these two examples of Imam al kadhim and Prophet Joseph, and there is many other examples like this as well, when you look at these two examples, you see that there were no CCTV cameras around. There's no camera, there was no cameras around. There was nobody around. They could have easily compromised their hijab for this purpose. But you see, first they had the taqwa. 
and second, they had the complete, um, complete control over their gaze. Third, they had the social hijab, and fourth, they had the physical hijab, and that's the hijab of men. Now, there's a one, I believe there is a one rule that if every man uh, abide by, then we'll have no problems. They'll be able to maintain the hijab. Um, this is actually a story from Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad once was sitting with his companions, and he was sitting with his companions, and this man came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said to him, he said, Oh, Prophet, I, I want to commit fornication. He said that to his Prophet. At that point, all the companions got up. They wanted to beat this man up. They said, what do you mean you're telling the prophet you want to commit fornication? So they all got up to beat this man. The prophet said, just, just you know, wait, wait a bit. And then he told him, he told the man, can I ask you a question? And the man said, yeah, sure, go ahead. He said, if, a, if you knew another man wanted to commit fornication with your mother, with your sister, with your daughter, or with your wife, would you, what would you do? That man said, what do you mean what I would do? I would, I would kill him. You know, if I knew another man had the same intentions about my sister, my mother, my female relatives, I would kill him. Then the prophet said, if you don't like another man having those thoughts or intentions about your mother, your sister, your wife, your daughter, then what makes it okay for you to have the same intentions about another man's mother, sister, and wife? The reason is if every man fought, if they are going to compromise their hijab, if they're going to compromise their physical hijab in order to attract another woman, if they're going to compromise their social hijab in order to attract another woman, they should think about, would you like that if another man done that to your female re relatives? And the answer is no. And that's through the example of the Prophet. If every man took this concept into, in his head, they will never compromise their social hijab. They will never compromise their physical hijab. Because what you do to another man's female relatives is what you, you wouldn't like be done to yours. So what gives you the right to do that to another woman? Now, when you come to the hijab of a woman, you see that the hijab of a woman, the next surah in Surah to nur verse number 31, tells the woman, O oh, believing woman, lower your gaze guide your private parts. Notice, that's the same as a man. And then it goes on further to say, do not display your or ornaments except what seems apparent. And then it says, and pull your head coverings over your bosoms. Now that's in Surah Nur, verse number 31. In this verse, it goes further to the man. So you have the physical, you have the social, you have the physical, and it goes on further to say, pull your head coverings over your bosoms. And it says, do not display your ornaments except what seems apparent. Now, Maraja and, um, and scholars of tafsir have said that do not display your ornaments except what, what, except what seems apparent is the oval of your face and the palm of your hand, so up to your wrist. They said that's the only thing a woman can reveal, so that's the requirements of hijab. Now, you know, I don't want to dwell too much into the requirements of the woman's hijab. I know, I've, you know, I don't want to take too much time, and I don't want, and I know I have um, past lectures on this topic about the requirements of hijab for women, but just rough, roughly explaining. In order to analyze this first, if anyone, you know, on a daily basis we get, we say that the hijab, the Quran doesn't require a woman to wear the hijab. People say that the, hijab, the Quran only talks about the generic terms of modesty and chastity. But when you come to analyze this first, you must have knowledge in certain aspects. Not anyone can come and analyze the Quranic ayat or the ayat in the Holy Quran. You see, when you come to analyze this verse, you must have knowledge in hadith and you must have knowledge in pre-Islamic Arabian culture. Now, if you know, before this verse was revealed in pre-Islamic Arabian culture, women already wore the headscarf. That was something that every woman already done. But what the women used to do, you know how bandanas are worn? They, they take the hijabs and they tie it backwards so all the necks, neck and the chest are revealed. That's how women in pre-Islamic Arabia used to wear the hijab. They used to reveal all their necks, their chest, and just cover their hair. So when this ayah was revealed, it was telling women, pull down the head coverings over your chest to cover your neck and chest. chest. This indicates that the hijab is already worn. If Allah was going to command a woman just to cover her neck and chest, if that was the only requirements of hijab, then the structure of that, of that ayah will be completely different. For example, if you go to a workplace and it says all shirts must be tucked in, that indication, that structure of sentence indicates that the the, the man or the individual is already wearing the shirt, but it's ordering them to tuck it in. Now, when it comes to this verse, it says, pull your head coverings over your chest. It means that the individuals are wearing a hijab, but they need to put it down over their chest. Now, further on, this verse further on says that 
you can you have to observe hijab except to your husband and to your father-in-law and to your fa fa the father of your husband and to your sons and your sister's sons and your uncles. Now, this is a question for those who say that the hijab doesn't require a woman to wear hijab. That if the Quran commands a woman to cover up and says, except to those f male relatives, then what is it that you could reveal in public? What is it that you can reveal in public that you can't reveal to your husband? If you don't have to wear hijab and you can wear normal clothing, then what more can you show to your father-in-law or to your sons or to your uncles? What more is there to show if the hijab is not required? There must be a physical requirement to hijab. That's why Allah says you need to physically cover up except to your father-in-laws and to your sons and to your, your nephews and to your uncles. There must be a greater physical hijab that you must wear in public and then the hijab that you must wear in front of your husbands and your male relatives. So there's a clear distinction between the physical hijab in public and to your female relatives, which you see that there is a, a physical need for a woman to cover up. Now, in America, there was a Scarfs for Solid Solidarity campaign. And what this campaign done is it got non-Muslims to wear the hijab. Now, it was quoted one American Muslim. She said that when I wore the hijab for the first time in my life, I felt like my, the bo my body was for me. The first time of my life, I, I owned my body. And the reason of this, I believe that we take advantage of hijab. You know, we see like, okay, hijab, we have to wear hijab, or it's hot to wear hijab. We don't really appreciate the hijab. For me, I, I never really, the, I believe that this, the, what led me to the success in my educational studies was my hijab. The hijab is such an empowering tool that when a woman comes up and she speaks or when a woman comes up in, in public or becomes active in public, no man can judge her for her looks because the only thing they could see is the oval of her face and their hands. So how could you just ju judge something that you can't see? That's the reason the hijab is so powerful. And what the Quran goes further on to say that many people think that the hijab is just a cloth on your head, that's it. It's not a physical requirement as in your body. Now, when you read in Surah Al-Hazab, Surah number 33, verse number 59, it says, it says, Ya ayyuha nabiyu, wa The Quran mentions the word jilbab, and that's what many people fail to understand. Now, I'm not saying jilbab as in abaya or jilbab we wear, the wear. Jilbab in the Arabic terms means outer garment. It means that a requirement for hijab, and this ayah is very clear for anyone that wants to look at it. The requirements of hijab as commanded by Allah, Allah tells, tell, Allah tells the Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women to wear an outer garment around themselves. So it means if a woman is wearing jeans and a top, she needs to wear an outer garment to cover the curves of her body. Hijab is about conceding that figure, that your body, that your body shouldn't, and another man shouldn't be able to tell the shape of your body. That is true hijab. And the ayah there is clear. Now there's different cultures. Some people wear abaya, some people, for example, you may wear jeans and a top and you can wear a loose jacket and top to cover your body. There's different ways of wearing this outer garment. But the outer garment in the Quran is present and it, Allah mentions it and tells a woman to wear an outer garment over her body. So you see, sisters, and, you know, I tell this to myself. I'm not better than anyone else. I may fall into sin just like any other girl here. But we, there is a need for us to wear the hijab. It's very important for us to wear the hijab. And it's really an empowering tool that an individual, you should take the concept of hijab and use it to your advantage. We can all use the hijab to our advantage. But when we have that fight, psychological state, we don't want to wear hi the hijab. That's when we don't see the benefits of hijab. We should all use the hijab to our advantage. You see that um, when, it, when we come to address the issue of hijab, now I don't know if many of you saw, but when this event was advertised, there's a sister that actually emailed me, and I posted this on Facebook and on Twitter as well. Um, when this, is, when this uh, event was advertised, the sister emailed me with a long email, and she was telling me, I'm struggling with hijab. She's saying, you know, I don't like wearing hijab. I'm struggling with hijab. Um, she said, you know, I've turned to makeup. I've turned to fashion. I've turned to clothes. I've turned to men um, just to satisfy myself because I don't feel like I'm worthy with wearing hijab. I see the girls not wearing hijab um, getting attention, and I think that I'm not as attractive as them. And what this email highlighted, for anyone that wants to read it, I've posted it on Twitter and Facebook because she requested me to. She said, I want people to know the struggles I go through. 
But what this email highlighted is that there's so many women currently struggling with hijab, which portrays to us the need to discuss hijab further. The reason is there are many sisters um, who, need, who, um, who are struggling with hijab. We need more female speakers out there. We need more people addressing hijab. We need to see more women so confident in their hijab and portraying the correct Islam while wearing their hijab. And um, the thing is that speakers or public speakers, when they address the issue of hijab, rather than looking down at their audience or judging the audience, they should be walking side by side their audience, supporting them. And um, we need more female speakers. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with Islam, when he came with Islam, he came with Islam and he, he gave more rights to women than he gave to men. He gave the same rights and responsibilities to women that corresponded with men. And the thing is, he said he gave the hijab to women and he said, use this to your advantage. And the women began to go to the battlefields with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They went to the battlefields, they supported the soldiers. Women became the envoy to spreading the religion of Islam. Women, um, the Prophet had female companions. The Imams had female companions. And Imam al-Mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala faraja, when he arrives, he's going to have female companions. Females have, have helped structure the religion in history and they will continue to do so when the Imam reappears. So therefore, there needs to be a greater need to put women out there and for them to spread the religion. Now, as Prophet, when this generation, you know, you say name a few public female speakers and it's really hard to name a name, well, a handful, but there's a great, you see more female, male speakers than you see for women. Now, in conclusion, I just want to say that um, recently, I've done a little segment for Channel 4. I don't know if any individual saw that. It was only one minute and 50 seconds. It was only one minute and 50 seconds. And it was broadcasted on Channel 4. Now, despite it being one minute and 50 seconds, it didn't really do much, much justice to the topic of hijab. But that one minute and 50 seconds broadcasted on Channel 4 it was after the Channel 4 news. When it was broadcasted, now this, I'm not counting the, the, the emails from Muslims, I received 118 emails from the British public. And this is not the emails that I received on Facebook or the messages from Facebook from Muslim individuals. 118 emails from the British public, non-Muslims. And 95% of them wanted to know more. And in fact, there's one guy I still remember, he emailed, his name was Dave. He emailed and he says, first of all, it's surprising to see a young woman wearing hijab and speaking so confidently about it. And second of all, he said, if the hijab is so great and it liberates women and it, puts wo and it gives that, those rights to women, then how come every lecture I see about hijab is by men? And how come every le Islamic lecture I see is by men? He said, if hijab is so liberating, then where are the women? Where are the liberated women? And that's the issue here. The hijab has broken us from the shackles of society. We, leave, we live in this hyper-sexualized society where women are used as a sexual commodity. That's a fact. See the billboards, see the magazines, see the way we're portrayed in the media. We're portrayed as a sexual commodity. That's the fact. And the fact is we need more women. And I truly believe that we have hijab. Therefore, we should have more educated females. We should have more active, act, um, active females than the West because we've broken three from the society. We're no longer submitting to us b being judged by our looks or our beauty or the figure of our body or whether we're fat or thin or whether, what color our hair is. We have been liberated by Islam, therefore we should use that to our advantage. And in conclusion, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but in cl conclusion, I just want to say from the examples that presented here by Imam Al-Kazim and Prophet Yusuf salam, and from the other examples of Islamic history, we see one clear principle here. And that principle is that despite the imperfect society we live in, despite the bad influence around us, despite the fact that we, we constantly put the blame of the bad society for us compromising our social hijab, compromising our physical hijab, despite that fact, we should be the individuals who emit the light of the Ahl Bayt in this society. We should influence others rather than, uh, rather than others influencing us. And we see that when we have control upon our gaze and our social hijab and our physical hijab, we will be such valuable individuals within society. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we um, are able to uphold the best levels of hijab and we're able to portray this religion in the correct way, especially as we're living in a in the Western society. Um, please say Allah salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah
say that as a woman myself um, I relate to all the women that may say that because I'm a young female living in the West as well I I've gone to university I've studied in the sec I've studied the secular education I've gone to the public university the fact is the hijab doesn't limit an individual it's all psychological and I truly believe that that when an individual thinks the hijab limits her then it will truly limit her it would limit you it's about how you perceive it and the psychological state the fact is that they say that they wear the minimum because it, it, it limits them but in fact if they if they um, abide by the full requirements of hijab it will actually push them further like I said it pushed me further in my educational studies the reason is that when a woman observes hijab, then men don't begin to mock her. Men don't begin to see her as a sexual commodity. Men don't begin to disrespect her, and therefore they'll take her seriously. She begins to be acknowledged for her intellect, her personality, rather than, oh, look what she's wearing or whether she's pretty or not. And that's the thing. When you eliminate these um, aspects, you see that it truly does liberate a female. And I'm a female myself, and I'm a young woman as well. I live in this society. I interact with this society. And... If you maintain the highest level of hijab, it doesn't limit you in any way, and I could I could say that for myself. It's all psychological. I really believe that. We got a question there. Um, how would you encourage young women to find females and girls to go out and also give public talks or speeches or well, press hmm. or something? I think um, so. For those, I don't know if you have the questions. How would you encourage other females to give public talks? Um, I think a woman should just have the intention of giving public talks and go out there and do it. Um, don't let anything limit you down. I think many people are afraid of fail failure and, you know, have the right intentions. I think when a woman has the right intentions to um, become an envoy to spreading the religion of Islam and to be give public talks, she should just go out there and do it. Gain your knowledge. There's a lot of books that she can read. You know, have the ba basic structure of religion. Read about the jurisprudence, about history. Um, read a bit of every aspect, history, jurisprudence. Have the, the main structure. And then go out there and spread the knowledge. Because in Islam, once you gain a, um, knowledge, then it's your responsibility to spread it. So gain the basic um, structure of religion in every aspect, then go and spread the religion, and then you'll just see it will just, it will just carry on and carry on. And it's, it's a very, I, I don't know how to say this, but as a public speaker myself, I've been to a few countries and I've presented TV shows. It's such a rewarding thing to be able to speak and um, don't let anyone get you down. So once you take that step, you'll just see it will just pathways will just open and open and you just see yourself um, spreading the religion and to be honest every female should have that aspect because when Imam Mehdi reappears um, he's going to have female companions so we should all be having that as our priority we should make that our priority to become worthy individuals because he will choose the best in inhabitants on this earth so we should really be individuals that wish to, wishes to, to reach that stage and gain knowledge and spread knowledge and be the be like the female companions that the prophets and the imams had. So I would say gain the um, basic knowledge um, and just go out there. Even if it's to a small audience, um, just start and then it, you'll see it, would, it will flourish. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I've got a question. Um, socially, you said there's social hijab. Mm. Um, many girls out there find that if they're wearing hijab, um, socially, they're restricted to do many things. Mm. And therefore, they feel because they can't enjoy themselves, um, they don't want to wear hijab. Now, uh, some of them do maintain hijab, but socially still active in the way that they shouldn't be doing. So what would you say? Would you say that be socially active, enjoy yourself, or restrict yourself and not do those things, but then you, you're kind of not exactly enjoying your life okay well in that answer when you say restrict yourself it seems like when the religion talks about social hijab it's restricting you from things which are not is harmful for that individual so i don't know what it restricts you in i mean 
you know, in terms of interacting with opposite gender? Is that what you mean? Or? Some, something like, let's say you're going to a birthday party, for yeah. instance. You know, oh, everyone's just there, but you can't exactly, if you were to maintain that social hijab, you're basically not being, you're being kind of antisocial around people. Or is it, are you talking about a mixed, a mixed environment? Yeah, men and women? Okay, if you, if you, you know, I go to birthday parties, I go to um, these social events as well. If, if it's a female environment, then you don't need to really observe a, a social hijab. But I think that a woman should, a, well, not I think, the religion says that a woman and man should observe social hijabs in a mixed environment with men. And I think that women and men need to keep that conversation to a minimal anyway, like, when a woman interacts with a man, it has to be formal, has to be straight to the point, because as the religion says through narrations, through stories, through, through the ayahs in the Holy Quran, and through the sayings of the prophets and the imams, it says that when you compromise your social hijab and you try to be relaxed, you know, it may be innocent at first, it may be innocent, but it always says it will lead to, um, it will lead to devi deviation one way or another. Even if you think that you can maintain yourself by compromising or being a bit um, soft on your social hijab, you see that, that how, how do you know the other man or individual are able to um, maintain their social hijab? So the thing is that men and, both men and women have the social requirements of the social hijab and the physical hijab is that when one, one party falls and then the other one has the social hijab, so they balance. That's why you maintain the chastity of society. But when everyone compromises their social hijab just to have fun, or even if they say it's innocent at first, it, it may lead to something else, as what the eyes is, as what the ha hadith say. So, when an individual, the thing is, it doesn't limit you from having fun, and that's what I think the misconception is. Everyone thinks that hijab is so limiting, or the hijab limits you both socially and physically, but it's really not. You can. You know, you can still go out and do the enjoyable things while maintaining your social and physical hijab. It's all the way that, it's the way you see it and the way that you use it to your advantage. So when in a mixed gathering, then a woman should up, uphold her social hijab. It may lead to something else. So that's why someone needs to maintain it. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you.